All right, we're going to talk about shoe wear for my um, walkers that are beginning a walking program and for my hikers that are going along with me on hikes. It's a, it's a big topic, but uh, I'll try to keep it sports specific. You can probably find other uh, videos and blogs out there uh, for more details, but we'll stick with hiking. In hiking, you have a choice of several different varieties of shoes. It all depends on what you're doing and where you're doing it. In Chicago, we have the drastic cold and snow of winter. We have the wet spring. We have the dry and usually plant-ridden summer. And then the kind of fall, uh, which is usually dry and uh, things open up. I think, for, for me, fall is the best time to hike. No insects. Uh, foliage is down so you can actually go off trail a lot easier uh, and the beautiful colors of fall but either way the bottom line is that uh, when it comes to picking a shoe or a boot uh, it would be important to have fit uh, so it's important to go to places that you can try on your boot or your shoe with the proper socks so usually it has to be the new technology now is to pick something that's a wool either 100% wool I don't mean itchy wool from the 70s, I mean the new merino wools, uh, or a wool blend at least. Uh, the studies show that it kind of pulls out fluid from the skin a lot easier so it prevents blistering. Uh, so the proper socks, if it's uh, winter you want them thick and probably high, if it's summer you just want them thick. So uh, it's important to uh, have for insulation, it's also important for comfort. Um, as you get through a watery environments, it might be important to swap things up. We'll talk about that in a second. So the first concept is the hiking shoe. This is a pair of my hiking shoes, and obviously just like normal shoes, you have the typical lace-ups. You have to look at your lugs underneath, and there should be some nice, um, you should be able to get a nice variety of grip depending on the surface. These are great for uh, dry. I've found that the rubber, at least the rubber portions of the lugs on these, if it's a wet and slick rock, they tend to be too slippery, uh, especially on man-made objects, so you have to be careful. Toes are, are very tight, the lacing system here is excellent, uh, and it is fabric, so it's easy to break this in. So it, that's an idea, you don't want to have, when you fit the shoe, you don't want to have your heels when you're coming down and lifting off. You don't want to have your heel come up more than a quarter of an inch. That means it's too tight or you're not lacing enough. Or perhaps the heel cup isn't uh, snug enough. Uh, it'll play in as you get to about 7 to 14 miles. If your heel keeps on coming up, you're going to get blisters somewhere. Same thing with the toe box. If the toe box, if your toes are at the front and they're touching or your toenails touching, as you go down an incline, your toes are going to be hitting the front of your toe box, or as you hit the 14 miles, your toes will be a little swollen and hitting the toe box again. Now, another um, phenomenon I've seen is people who have, uh, say, mild arches, not flat-footed, but mild arches, as they put their foot into the shoe, after fatigue sets in in about three or four hours, the arch will collapse a little bit, and when your arch collapses, if you watch my hand, as your arch collapses, your toes move forward so that half inch or quarter inch in the front when your toes go forward and your arch collapse you'll be hitting toenail especially your great toe, great toenail hits the front you'll have black toe that'll be painful after a while especially heading downhill like at Devil's Lake or some of the undulating hills of Palos Hills or Starved Rock if you're heading down from a hike up into say Zion or Utah going down for the next three to four hours will be painful to the front of the toe um, so you have to have something with a good amount of room in the toe box, I'd say quarter inch, and then a snug heel, uh, a heel cup. So the support is important without being painful. There are these things called hot spots. If the, the, the fabric is too tight, you know that usually you'll have to have a break-in period uh, with your shoes. And the fabric uh, shoes are usually broken in a lot faster because they have a little more give than the full leather pieces. So that, that also might play depending into your decision making, depending on how soon your hike is, um, how irregular your feet are, if they're extra wide. Uh, so some places, some old fashioned places will actually have this contraption that stretches out the leather before, uh, right after you buy it, before you go wear it. So it uh, cuts down on your need to break in the shoe with hiking. 
So those are options to keep in mind. There's a wide variety of uh, different show. Keens typically have wider toe boxes. I've found that uh, you can't trust if you take uh, on your on that measuring stick. If you take a standard, say it's nine and a half, you can't trust the companies just by ordering a nine and a half online because different companies have narrow, more narrow than usual shoes or wider shoes. So you really have to try them on. The best place I've found to try on shoes is REI because you can actually, if you're a member, you can actually take them home after you pay for them. And if you don't wear them outside, just wear them around the house. Try on different heavy packs. Try to find an incline somewhere. Go up and down the steps. If you find that you it doesn't feel comfortable, you can actually return them, no questions, and then get another pair of shoes. So uh, that's what the benefit of REI, and that can be even done with a mail order. The one thing before we go off the topic of uh, shoes, hiking shoes, is that um, I would always invest in a pair of gaiters. These are gaiters. They go around the base of the shoe and they go up around the ankle. These are important if you're going through, uh, if you're going to use your hiking shoe in the snow and you're post holing or going up, going into the snow, going up again, going into the, another step in the snow. These are good for keeping snow out of your socks or even if you have long pants, the snow can still get in. So gaiters are nice. Uh, for walking through uh, uh, crossing streams, for example, you'll still get wet, but going through brush or uh, if you're going off trail and you're going to be rubbing against vines, this is uh, pretty good. It protects you against thorns if you're wearing shorts. So uh, nice to have gaiters. So next we'll talk about the hiking boot. Uh, these are my Solomons. These are, I, I love these. The, as soon as I put these on, because again they're fabric I had no hot spots or no rub spots that uh, were painful uh, in, essentially broke them in within the first week uh, very tight support around the ankle so these are mid-rise they're actually higher ones than this you've probably seen the real high ones that the military guys wear or you wear on expeditions to Italy uh, they have very high lace-ups I don't think you need that for your average beginner but this mid-rise is, is pretty decent. It gives you a little bit of ankle support, especially if you're uh, going for, uh, uh, say, a 5 to 10 miler with uh, 20 to 30 pounds on your back. You need support in the ankle. It has your crossing. I use these to cross uh, small creeks. And I think these do, because of the GTX or the Gore-Tex here, they do keep my feet dry. Some of them uh, don't have full lining or not waterproof, so you have to be careful. You have to read the specs. Uh, these are pretty decent for uh, winter, but I would usually have to double up on socks if they'll fit properly. Um, but I, I love the way they fit and they're ready to break in. The lugs on this are very deep and they also are very grippy, almost like um, winter snow tires. They have micelles, at least technology built into the rubber that it adheres faster uh, and uh, uh, over wet uh, surfaces. Uh, the arches are pretty good in this. Um, it, again, I go for about a quarter inch in the front of a little bit of wiggle room and then a quarter inch rise of the heel. If my heels are uh, coming up too much or I'm getting a sore spot for prolonged uh, hiking, it, it's nice because you, you can adjust the lace-ups. They are fixed cross uh, up until the last three. The nice uh, thing with this lace-up is you can lock the, right as you get between foot and ankle, you can lock up the laces and they stay tight here and you can loosen them up, up here. And I'll go through a, um, a lacing scenario later on. but uh, So I love these. Uh, I can wear them uh, with long pants, short pants, uh, protective and supportive, also pretty light. So uh, the only problem I have to uh, tell you about Gore-Tex is that uh, there supposedly is there are these components that make shoes waterproof and clothing waterproof that have potential carcinogenic uh, possibilities. So if you go to ewg.org, it'll give you the um, things to watch out for in some of the materials that you find in hiking and camping. The beauty of hiking and camping materials nowadays is that they're so thin, they're breathable, but some of the synthetic um, components within the material has uh, problems with it in that persistent exposure to these chemicals uh, can cause a reaction that um, can potentially lead to problems down the line like autoimmune disorders. 
that's all I'm going to say about that. I, uh, again, you have to take that with a grain of salt. For those of you who are very conscious about uh, dioxan or perchlorofluorines, uh, you should know about GTX or uh, Gore-Tex and waterproofing material. But uh, that all aside, I think there, it's, there's time to enjoy hiking and we'll go on to talking about this. The, the next uh, thing is the one-piece uh, leather. Now this isn't technically all one piece, it's still two pieces. This is a Merrell. This is what you use for winter. Thicker boot, heavier boot, uh, because it is uh, one big piece on the lower portion. I think this was harder to break in because of the, there's less, uh, less places to give. But it did eventually break in. Uh, these were great. The lugs on this were fantastic. Even through freezing temperature, they still remained rubbery. Uh, I was able, because of the support, especially in the toe box, uh, even if there was a quarter inch left, I was able to, in certain inclines, in winter here, it's very, the, the ground is very hard and it's very hard to break, but sometimes slippery. So sometimes you have to dig in tight and then take a step and take your next step if you're going up uh, incline. Uh, and these were able to, I was able to get right through some uh, hardened dirt. It's also able to put crampons on this and get through ice and do a little bit of ice climbing. Um, so the one problem with this is that it's waterproof and uh, winterized, so it's insulated. So if I use this in the summer, my feet will get sweaty because it's poor insulation. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. In addition to the, the more, uh, less, I guess the less pieces of fabric on it, the more one-piece hiking shoe or alpine shoe, the longer it takes to break that stuff in, especially if it's one piece of leather. So something to keep in mind, but there's still the same components of having a, a bunch of variable rubber compounds to your lugs, having about a quarter inch play in the front in the toe box, and then having about a quarter inch heel lift. That's all I would expect with this. The lacing, the lacing system is fixed, um, but it does give you some variability if you want to change your lacing style, depending on if you have hot spots at a couple miles. You can actually do that, and if I can't do it with this talk, I'll, I'll put links to the REI's um, suggestions on how to lace up if you have hot spots. Uh, aside from that, uh, if it, again, if you're getting into winter, um, winter hiking or ice climbing, your boots should be ready for uh, crampons, and uh, crampons are essentially ice picks or ice spikes. Um, you have to have special shoes for that. Uh, good shoe, but it's very hot and sometimes heavy. The last um, we'll talk about is sometimes as you're going through the uh, season in Chicago, you will need or you might want to have a pair of crossing shoes. I have these. These are water crossing shoes. They essentially can, they have good lugs. They can drain out and they're mesh, but they are, uh, and they're, uh, the lacing system in Solomon's is awesome without needing uh, laces and uh, doing a surgeon's knot or overhand knot. You just pull on the cords and they tighten up. The only problem with this is if you expect to do this, I did this in Zion and Utah and it was uh, I, after a while because of the wet skin, my feet uh, and the rub spots, it can cause some blisters to form if you're not used to them and you're, uh, when you're wearing them when your feet are wet. So be careful and try them out. Again, very lightweight. You can collapse them, keep them in your pack and they're just pulled out when you have to do a water crossing. Are the two basic problems I find when people have hot spots or sore spots to their hiking boots. It can also happen in shoes, but typically it's to the hiking boots. I had somebody who had the typical injury or was having a typical hot spot uh, after about, I think it was two miles or three miles, and she was breaking in a new pair of boots. So the first uh, problem or scenario would be when you have a hot spot or area of rubbing to the medial malleoli or the lateral malleoli. Those are the ankle bones, the inside ankle bone or the outside ankle bone. Because of the high tops, you're going to have, you're supposed to have support, but sometimes you'll have over gripping and it'll rub painfully hard. So what you want to do with that is you want to still lace the foot part up nice and snug. So again, you do the typical cross pattern, but as you get to the transition between the foot and the, uh, and the ankle, you do a double overhand knot. So you do the typical overhand, but you tie it one more time, so it's double overhand. And the reason for the double overhand is it should stay snipe. It should stay locked in. So that means the stiffness that you did, and you keep on pulling these. I can't demonstrate it here 
because there's nobody that's in my shoe, but you pull these nice and snug all the way up to the double overhand and you give some resistance while you throw the double overhand knot in and it stays snug. So now you've locked everything in nice and snug down here because there's no sore spot or hot spot down here. The part up here is the hot, with the hot spot you want loose. So in this case, with my Solomons, there's a locking lug, so it makes it a lot easier here, or locking uh, eyelet. So this is actually locked into place. Again, I have the backup for my double overhand here. And I want to tie the ankle portions, or the ankle eyelets, somewhat snug. You can't have the ankle eyelets too snug. I'm going to try to do this without a model in here. Uh, but you can't have them too uh, loose because they'll pop out on you. But you want them snug so you're not moving too much. They're not popping out and you're not having to retie every five minutes. But you're also not continuing to get irritation to the hot spot. And that's pretty much it. Now that's a little bit too loose, but again, there's no model in here. So you're keeping everything down here snug. You're locked in at the transition and your ankle portion is loose. You can actually loosen this more. As long as you don't keep it too loose, the, the, lace, the lace is too loose so that it, it pops out all the time, which is a pain in the butt to always um, take your pack off and retie. Uh, that's the concept of taking care of a hot spot in the ankle. There's also hot spots that are going to occur in the foot. The dorsum of the foot is where the extensor tendons come up. The extensor tendons go down the front of the foot, they go down into the toes, and they're responsible for lifting the toes up. So if you're doing a lot of uh, toe lifting, like your regular surfaces crossing streams or ponds or pulling out of mud, you might irritate the dorsum of the foot and you want that nice and loose. So here I went ahead and re re uh, uh, positioned the threads so they're just going outside, you just cross once and you go along the outside of the bottom eyelets. You go along the outside and you make your way up to the transition where the foot meets the ankle and that's where you lock it. Hopefully it's not painful up here, but it usually isn't, but that's where you lock it in. Again, you can lock it with a double overhand. And with the, again with these eyelets at the transition, the Solomons kind of lock in on their own. But now you have a loose tongue, a loose dorsum. From this point on, it should be really snug because you don't want both the foot and the ankle snug because you'll be slipping on and slipping out of us. You'll be like wearing a slipper, but you do want this nice and snug. And here, I'm going to try to tie this tight so it stays, even if I don't have a real foot in here. And for me, if the laces are too long, which is fine, I double knot. So that takes care of loosening up the dorsum so you don't rub here, but still keeping a grip here so your foot stays within the shoe. Hopefully that makes sense. And those are the two biggest scenarios with regards to dorsum of the foot rubbing or ankle rubbing. Hey, so this is what I was talking about with regards to having high tops. Um, I've got my Solomons on. And it just rained in the last two days, but this is the mud that we're kind of trekking through. So it makes a little bit of a difference. Um, sometimes the inclines will be really slippery, but if you choose the low positions of the trail, you'll end up with this. And if you don't have high tops on, you can sink like that. So, could be a problem, but the benefit of these guys.